Uh, we are going to have the invocation, and uh, our invocator is not here today, well, Lewis Jones, so I'll do it. Okay. Creator of everything good, we ask you to bless this council. We ask you to bless the people of Virginia Beach, the Commonwealth, and our great nation. Make us safe. Make us sound. Let unity prevail. Let us all reach out to each other and embrace and get along and really focus on what we have in common, not what we have dividing us. We have important work to do. We have our challenges in front of us. We ask for your guidance and blessing. Thank you. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America all right, uh, Madam Clerk, roll call. Uh, all present, including Councilmember Jones. Okay. 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 Oh, uh, Lou, uh, he is out on business. Okay. Um, now I ask for a uh, motion for a certification of the closed session. So moved. Second. Okay. Vote is open. It's open. There we go. By a vote of 10 to 0, you certify the closed session to be in accordance with the motion to recess. Okay. Now we're going to ask for a motion uh, to approve. Approve the minutes of the informal and formal sessions of January 18th. So moved. Second. Okay, vote is open. Mr. Tower. I'm trying to remember whether I was here. <laughs> <laughs> I believe you. Me too. I, was trying to I, I missed one meeting. The uh, is this a this what I was missed a workshop. This is a formal session. Yeah, this is a formal. By a vote of nine to zero, with Vice Mayor Wilson abstaining, you've approved the minutes as submitted. Okay, and um, now we're going to open up the public comment on the legislative request to add an amendment of the marriage provision to the Constitution of Virginia, requested by Council Member Berlucci. Uh, the first speaker is, speaker is Melissa Lukeson. Lukeson, I'm sorry. Melissa Lukeson, James Nicholson. And after Mr. Nicholson will be, um, we'll begin our WebEx speakers. Okay. Hey, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'm here to speak in favor of a legislative request regarding the marriage amendment in the Virginian Constitution. And I would like to simply ask, start with a question. What does the Marshall Newman Amendment currently mean in the Commonwealth of Virginia? Does it stand there only as an oversight as the Commonwealth has moved forward past its old legacies of, of the past, as we have removed competitive statues in 2020, finally repealed segregation laws from the books, is it simply an oversight which we are just now getting to? Or is it sitting there with a vague hope by some people in the state that Virginia still holds to that amendment and that they were only dragged towards constitutionality of same-sex marriage by the forceful hand of the federal government. And I cannot believe that the latter part of that is true, and that it's only an oversight which we are just now getting to, which we should get to. Because, as some say, it takes three things to make a trend. First, we have seen in 2020 that we finally overturned segregation laws, which are still, were still in place despite being unconstitutional. We saw just this past year that we have finally begun to remove Confederate statues and the legacy of the Confederacy in the state. And so now it's the trend that we must revisit the Marshall Newman Amendment and request that it be finally taken away from the Virginia Constitution. It is not merely a symbolic measure as well. Even though it cannot be actually enforced due to the Supreme Court and a district court overturning its constitutionality, it still has real effects in the school system. Even though the issuing of marriage licenses cannot be prevented to same-sex couples. When students walk into Virginia and they go into 
sex, sex education, which teaches abstinence until marriage. The constitutional definition of marriage in the Commonwealth of Virginia is marriage between one man and one woman. Regardless of whether the state cannot actually refuse issuing of amendments and licenses to same-sex couples, students are still taught a framework where marriage is between a man and a woman. In the name of fairness, the name of equity, justice, which we've already begun to implement in the state the past few years, we must continue that trend and push for the overturning of the amendment. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Great job. Barbara Massner, I do not see her. We'll go to the WebEx speakers now. The first one is Virginia Jankot. If you will pause two to three seconds before beginning, you are unmuted. Good, Good evening, Mayor Dyer and council members. My name is Dr. Virginia Jankot, uh, but most of you know me by Ginger. I currently serve on the Virginia Beach Human Rights Commission, but I'm not speaking for the commission tonight. I am addressing you tonight as a private citizen. I have served as vice president on the board of directors for Hampton Roads Pride, which is the leading LGBT advocacy organization in the area. Over the last five years, I have invited all of you many times to Pride events, and I've stood alongside you in advocating for the LGBT community. I am so grateful for the support you have given for our community in support of non-discrimination. But what tugs at me right now is this. When a law targets one group of people, it is discrimination. I am so thankful that I am able to stand before a group of elected officials who have taken a vow to represent the people, all people, and to know that you will do your best to encourage the Virginia General Assembly to also support the LGBT community. So in support of marriage equality, I encourage you to include in your legislative packet the amendment of the marriage provision of the Constitution of Virginia. It's the right thing to do for all people. Your support as the leaders of Virginia Beach will resonate loudly in Richmond. I cannot emphasize enough that when a law targets one group of people, it is discrimination. We have come so far together to eliminate discrimination in housing and employment for the LGBT community. And I hope we continue this. I thank you for your service and for representing me and the LGBT community's right to marry who we love. Thank you. The next speaker is WebEx, Michelle Lauder. If you'll pause two to three seconds before beginning, you are unmuted. Good evening. I want to start off by saying that I've been married to my husband, Scott, for 33 years. I chose him as my partner because of the love he and I shared for one another. Love comes in all forms. It would be wrong to say that a person cannot marry someone just because they are not from the opposite sex. I read something recently that truly resonated with me. Marriage should be between a spouse and a spouse, not a gender and a gender. Everyone deserves the life they desire and to the person they love. Same-sex marriage should be legal because the Constitution expresses equality. According to the Constitution, individuals have a right to privacy of who they want to spend their lives with. Inhibition of same-sex marriage will only violate these rights and freedom of individuals. In addition, the Constitution does not specify the right to marry as the right to marry someone of the opposite sex. It has nothing to do with sex, gender, or race. It specifies the right for whoever one shares serious desire with, regardless of his or her sexuality. This means that both same-sex couples and heterosexuals have the same motivation and desire for marriage with similar goals. Who are we to deny anyone their rights and their ability to fulfill their dreams? Our world is evolving more than ever. People can finally start to become themselves and own their own independence. Just because someone does not love a person from the opposite sex doesn't make them wrong. 
We can love and should be able to marry any one of our choosing. Thank you for taking the time to listen. Taking the time also. The next speaker is Junico Rodriguez. Ms. Rodriguez, if you'll pause two to three seconds before beginning, you are unmuted. I am Junito Rodriguez, and my preferred gender pronouns are he, him, and his. I thank you for this moment to speak on marriage equality. This is a subject that truly hits home for me, not only because I am a resident of Virginia Beach and a member of the LGBTQ community, but because I am a man who is married to another man. Five years ago, I married my partner of eight years, Gary Dion Rodriguez. We married in my native New York City. It is a decision we did not take lightly. We very much knew the importance of us having rights as a married couple. Many of our mentors told us their stories. They had gone through decades of being with their partners without being with the right of marriage. Time and time again, same-sex partners were separated from each other without a say about their loved one's medical treatment or estate, if in case they passed away. This was especially true during the HIV and AIDS crises of the late 1980s and early 1990s. Can you imagine being with someone for years, a person whom you love very much, and then all of a sudden not have a say about anything whatsoever in regards to them? With the blink of an eye, you have lost where you live. You have no rights to the possessions both of you work so hard for. And even furthermore, you are denied the right to see your partner one last time as they are buried at an undisclosed location. In many of those situations, the families did not approve of their loved one's lifestyle choices, greatly affecting the other partner. So this brings me to the year 2022. Are we going to allow this injustice? I certainly hope not. I want to live in a Virginia in which I can have the right just like anybody else, regardless of my gender or sexual orientation, in where my marriage is fully recognized under the law and all my rights are completely upheld. I want the right to be with my husband and for us to be able to make decisions that work for our family. We're not asking for special treatment. We simply want what everyone else has, equal rights under the law. So I earnestly ask you today, please do not take away the rights of my husband and I and support marriage equality for all of those who reside in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Appreciate it. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, we will now move on to the public hearing on the exchange of excess prop city property at 2395 North Landing Road to uh, Princess Anne Village, LLC, approximately 43,140 square feet of city-owned property. Uh, we had one speaker signed up, Barbara Messner, but I do not see her in the audience. Okay. No in this case, uh, it, well, we can go direct to the consent agenda. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we'll do the add-on afterwards. And we'll do the add-on afterwards. You have to. Okay, under ordinances and resolutions, oh. number one. Oh, hold on. Uh, you're going to approve the item on the consent agenda, correct? So you would need to add it first. Okay. All right, we're going to add as number eight the declaration of a local emergency due to winter storm Keenan. Do I have a Do you need a motion? Motion. So moved. Second. Okay, votes open to, for the add on. And that will be number By a vote of 10 to 0, you have added this to the agenda. Okay, so under ordinance and resolutions, number one, ordinance to declare approximately 43,140 square feet of city property at 2393 North Landing Road in excess of the city's needs and authorize the city manager to execute all disposition and exchange documents with Princess Anne Village LLC and Kellum and Eaton Incorporated regarding Foxfire Trail. Under number two, uh, B, sections 1-3, 1-6, 1-12, 1-13, 1-14, 1-15, 1-16, 1-17, 1-18, 1-19, 1-20, 1-21, 1-22, 1-23, 1-24, 1-25, 1-26, 1-27, 1-28, 1-29, 1-30, 1-31, 1-32, 1-33, 1-34, 1-35, 
City Code Floodplain Ordinance Appendix K regarding housekeeping, the deletion of public works requirements, and the addition of a coastal A zone and a coastal high hazard zone. Number three, ordinance to confirm the declaration of a local emergency regard winter storm Jasper. Number four, resolution to declare 1049 and 1053 Virginia Beach Boulevard to be a revitalization area regard qualifying for Virginia housing financing. Number five, ordinance to authorize temporary encroachments into portions of the city's right of way known as 36th Street and Atlantic Avenue, commonly referred to as the City Green Belt, adjacent to 3601 Atlantic Avenue by the Belvedere Hotel Investments Associates, LLC. Ray install and maintain a seat wall, landscaping, storm drain, concrete flume, and irrigation system, District 6 Beach. Uh, six, we have a speaker. Seven, and Mr. Moss will be voting no on this. Ordinance to authorize longevity and college incentives for the sworn employees of the fire department and emergency medical services, as well as employees in the emergency communication division of emergency communications and citizen services and transfer $1,216,553 from vacancy savings within the general fund to the FY 2021-22 Fire Department, Emergency Medical Services Division of Emergency Communications and Citizen Services Operating Budgets. Number eight is the declaration of a local emergency due to winter storm Keenan. <laughs> public hearing. Okay, uh, the uh, public hearing I'm planning. And there isn't anything hearing it, sorry. That's it. Oh, yeah, that would yeah, be our next back. Okay, any discussion? Then the vote is open. We, we don't have a second. Okay, second, we don't. Second. Uh, sorry. Okay. Mr. Holcomb, may I have your vote? Yes, Mr. Boss. Thank I'm sorry, by a vote of 10 to 0, you have approved the or the consent agenda as read by Vice Mayor Wilson, noting uh, Mr. Moss's nay vote. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think I'm a few minutes late. However, Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of Council, at your place setting, there were new versions of the stormwater and the floodplain ordinances. They are simply um, periods, changing numbers that have been transposed, that kind of thing. There's the, the floodplain ordinance, it is line 881. That's a paragraph. We changed the paragraph to make it more readable. <laughs> The um, stormwater are just a few. Well, I do believe to make those corrections, the minutes have to, the vote would have to be amended or redone. I look at the attorney because we have to cite this document. They amended one. Com yes, sir. Council is comfortable with what you just put forward. <laughs> no. I, I agree. It should have been described before the vote. Yes. So how do we fix it? All right. We just make it um, you'll have to have a substitute motion to approve those items as amended at your place okay and we do that Move. but you know, with I'm, the normal I'm sorry, i need to know which numbers on the agenda k um, um, well i understand that's where they are massing the numbers J2, yeah. B and is this a wholesale yes, replacement yes Yes, sir. Can we identify this document and put an exhibit on it and say exhibit A so the emotion knows exactly what what document we adopted? Um, it is under two if we make uh, the one for stormwater uh, two B. Do you want we to do make that? It as amended and put an exhibit A. Yeah, on I think it. exhibit A is best so it's distinctly and legally right. identifiable. Mm -hmm. Yep. Good point, John. So okay. is one under B and one's under C? Is that right? It yes, would sir. be B and C, yes, ma'am. Okay, exhibit A for each one. Um, under consent, we amend 2B, exhibit A, and 2C, exhibit A. Okay, we need a second on that? Not no. 2A. 2A has been pulled. Right, 2B and B. I mean, C. sorry, 2B and 2C, excuse me. And they're both under Exhibit A. Okay. They both will be identified as amended as Exhibit A. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Did we get a second? So moved. Okay. We got the second. We're open. Mr. Tower. 
Mr. Tower, did you make the original motion? I think so. I think so, too. <coughs> Mr. Branch? Do you need this? I have one. Thank you. Okay. Five vote, thank 10 you. to 0. You have approved as amended. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me for my Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Uh, I, I, I go out to Councilman Moss. I yield to him. Well, thank you, uh, Councilman Rouse. I just wanted to explain my no vote on item J7. It's the same no vote I registered with the sheriff uh, proposal on January 18th uh, to do incentive payments and longevity payments for EMS and fire. We are in pot. We are within weeks of receiving, if not days of receiving, our total compensation package. It appears to me that we should have looked at these issues and what needs to be corrected after we comprehensively understood what the delta we were trying to fill in terms of being competitive. Secondly, you get the educational benefit independent of what the education is. I'm concerned of the message to other people who have degrees that they're required to have in their position are getting no educational incentive. I don't know what we're telling the rest of the workforce who goes out and get degrees, and equally, whether it's psychologists, social workers, or whatever, they're not getting an ins educational incentive pay. I don't envy the city manager having to explain that. I think we would have been much better positioned to have deferred these. It wasn't a, two months to, you know, we'll be talking about that total compensation package. More importantly, if this is what we believe we need to do in terms of monetary for retention, then we should just increase the salary and move on and stop these gimmicks to try to make we don't have to deal with our whole population. But instead, we seem like those that are better organized get differential treatment, and we're not sending a consistent message across the workforce when we make the city manager's life more difficult. More importantly, I'd rather be paying bonuses to buy service going forward than recognizing past service because we have a retention problem. So if we're going to have a program trying to solve our retention, we might want to look at the military and have retention pay rather than longevity pay. So I don't think we've really given this the look. But more importantly, we just didn't take the time and the pause to look at what the total compensation package does. And what if it comes out and tells us something differently? This reminds me when I was at Green Run High School and I spoke against the B the business and uh, tool tax. Council passed it within three weeks after hearing from uh, Steel, we reversed ourselves finding out that they paid over 50% of the whole tax in the city. Once again, we are acting before we know what the landscape is. This is not good governance. This is not good financial stewardship. I understand the dynamics of the players, but we paid and invested good money and this is not and can't be explained to the larger workforce, why are they different? Because there's no analytical foundation behind this. There's no empirical analysis that says it will buy the outcome that we hope. And I am very disappointed this is the path that we have taken. Okay, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, speaking of the large workforce, I just want to make my in intentions known. While I'm proud to support our, our fire EMS um, employees in the Emergency Communications Division um, of Emergency Communications and Citizen Services. I'm also looking forward to the uh, market salary um, survey to come back so we can support um, those in public works who we heard from last week um, and all the difficulties that, that, they're, that they are having because of low pay. I'm also looking forward to support those in public utilities, parks and recs, human services, the rest of our city staff who also help to keep our city going. And so, again, while I'm, I'm proud to support um, our, our first responders, I also want to make sure we're going to support our city staff. And that's something that I, am throughout this budget cycle, I'm going to be intent on and hoping to have support so we can make sure our, our staff is, is well paid. Thank you. Yeah, I concur with your reasoning, uh, Mr. Uh, Rouse. And, uh, I, hopefully, we're going to be really moving forward in the same direction. Okay, Ms. Emily. Well, I think we can make a very important distinction with yes, these employees that we are. Uh, uh, Ms. Okay. You're out of order. Thank I'm, I'm you. I'm aware. I'm letting you know I'm here because you're not calling me and you're letting. Uh, yeah, the consent agenda was already read. Mm -hmm.
Okay, please. Another barber was talking. Um, <laughs> I think there's a very distinct difference between the employees that we are addressing here and the rest of the workforce, and that is because these particular departments have got extreme, an extreme number of vacancies. They must be filled 24-7. It's causing a great hardship, but more than that, it takes a long time to train the new people to fill these positions. And we just can't wait until July 1 for this to be addressed. Um, and, and I think there is a, a, a very distinct difference. It doesn't mean we're not concerned with the other employees. We certainly are. And we will be addressing that very soon with the, uh, with the budget. But I guess we have this question that we keep asking, when is the market survey going to come out? And I ask again, with part of our, whether it was CARES or ARPRA or whatever money, we did give a big chunk of money to the Workforce Council to look at the vacancies and, and what we need to do to address it. And I think their final report was supposed to have been out mid-December, and that was supposed to be able to tell us what the things are that we need to address. So two things, when is our, our uh, uh, market survey going to be available to us, and when are we going to be able to see this Workforce Council data? So, Councilmember Henley, we reached, starting with a Workforce Council survey, so that survey was specifically for the um, hospitality industry and only for the hospitality industry only. We reached out to them and they should be getting something prepared for us for, Taylor, is it this Friday package? Yeah. For us to present to you all. Um, so we should be able to get that information for you there. The market salary survey, we plan to brief council through into um, retreat, uh, specifically on what those are. Now that the retreat is not going to be until later, we're still, anyway, we've been waiting a long time for that, and, and I hope we can get it soon. But I thought that we also addressed um, mental health with some of the market workforce issues, too. So I was hoping that that was going to be broader than just the tourism industry, but we'll just be grateful for whatever we get, and uh, I'd like to see their data. Okay, thank you, Mr. Rouse. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, I, 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 I make no, um, not being differential to um, comments of, of my fellow council member, um, but just speaking historically about the men and women in public works, they have been historically underpaid and undervalued, and even from their perception from the city. So I think it's, it's important, and I think I would like to, it should be vital um, that we find a way to, to increase their salaries, to find the benefits that they need to be able to, to do their work and take care of their families as well. But not to mention, I mean, we have vacancies throughout our city, not just in public works, but public utilities, parks and recs. You know, we, we talk about the, the, the manpower um, that we don't have because of people are leaving, retiring, um, and also trying to find a ways to attract and retain workers. So again, um, this finding employers and workers, I should say. Finding workers is, is, is a daunting task for anybody these days. Um, we certainly have our, have our work cut out for us, but um, historically, the men and women in public works have, have been you know, working at, at um, I, I would say, um, working hard on what they are, they are valued at. And so, again, for our staff that works here, I think it's important that one of the first things we do is, is figure out how do we raise their salaries, how do we find their benefits, and how we, we continue to support them so they can support us. And that goes across the board. That's why I was happy to support our, our law enforcement officers, our, our fire department, our, our first responders. Um, again, this is a team effort. We can't have one part of our team sitting so high and the other part of our team, you know, asking for more resources. You know, we have to make sure we we have this certain level of equality and equity um, throughout our, our city staff. And so, Mr. Mayor and um, Council, thank you for um, your, your support in making sure we can um, support our, our workers, our staff workers.
Yeah, I, yeah I'm pretty sure that, that, that that's going to be a major priority for us going forward. Okay, uh, Ms. Wilson. Um, I certainly agree with a lot of Mr. Rouse had to say, and, and even though I missed that evening that so many people from public works and utilities came forward, I, I watched everything. And, and these are very valuable employees that make us look good. They have difficult jobs, and the, <coughs> the citizens and we really need them. Absolutely. And so this market survey is going to be really important. And we did a lot for public safety last year with the budget. And so I'm hoping that this year we're going to be able to really look hard at really doing a lot more for the other segments of our employees. That's, I, I agree with you. I think that's something we're really going to need to do because we need them as more, probably more than they need us. So it's very, it's going to be very, very important. And, and I think schools are kind of doing the same thing because we are in a labor crisis. So I'm sure Mr. Duhaney is going to do his very best to bring us forth a really good budget, which is his budget, but then we will take that budget and we'll work on it and then it becomes our budget. Could I just yeah, one yes, closing yes, comment? Well, I'm glad that my explanation drove such a robust discussion because I have brought out that if you go back and remember in the budget, I think the reserve, and Mr. Duhaney will correct me, correctly to implement the compensation it was three million dollars or it was five but there was a reserve that we set aside in that amount and when you look at the percentages that we may or may not see against the 600 million dollar labor expense roughly in our budget 10 percent 60 million five percent 30 million our reserve and that's why i have consistently said as we continue to spend our cash surpluses from overperformance from last year, we are doing that without due consideration to the liabilities that we all want to liquidate going forward. We're going to get there and find out that we spent all the money before we got to the train station, and then you're going to tell me we have to raise taxes to take care of our employees. This is not how good businesses operate their business. We are not conserving our cash and our recurring revenues until we know all the bills. So I just want to be saying that again, because I'm sure we're going to arrive at the train station and we are going to have to make difficult choices that we wouldn't have to have made if we took a more comprehensive look and kept more of our gunpowder before we knew all the guns we had to load. So that's my closing remarks there. I hope that doesn't come to fruition, but that appears to be the path we are on. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, uh, let's move on to uh, re resolution ordinances 2B. Now I get 2A, to read the sorry. numbers. 2A. 2A. Oh, that's right. We do have the 2A. <coughs> um, <coughs> excuse me. Chapter 8, Stormwater Management of Public Works Design Standards Manual, Ray Bringing into Compliance. Uh, the first speaker is Brad Martin. After Mr. Martin is Barbara Messner. Good evening. Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. My name is Brad Martin, and I've lived in Bay Lake Pines Offshore Drive for over 20 years. I don't think you're going to hear anybody from the development community tonight speak against the basic tenets of the stormwater regulations. One and a half feet of sea level rise and 20% heavier rainfalls are rational protections that we're on board with. I'm personally stunned that your city engineers have proposed tonight the abandonment of some sea level rise protections after not even two years of enforcement. I think you understand the fallacy of trying to solve yesterday's problems at Princess Anne Plaza, Windsor Woods, and Asheville Park by throttling down on tomorrow's Wawa or a shadow lawn duplex. There aren't enough tomorrow's Wawa's to fix our prior problems, and I'm glad you all have shown the discernment recently to spend more of our stormwater fees on the maintenance and rehabilitation of our existing drainage infrastructure, which is sorely needed and will have consequential impacts. I hesitate to delve into the details of the proposed ordinance, but I want to briefly discuss what probably seems like a benign sentence on the first page. The ordinance states, quote, analysis of existing conditions shall be required to the same level of detail and extent as the proposed drainage system, unquote. 
It seems innocent, doesn't it? We are tasked to analyze the existing situation, compare it to the proposed, and the developed project must achieve a reduction in characteristics, flow rates, runoff volumes, and pollutants versus the existing. So we have to compare apples to apples, right? Let me tell you that we consultants have been bickering with your review staff for the past 18 months, not just over the accuracy of the stormwater models, but also over minuscule issues like the quality of existing turf, the flow path of a raindrop from the backyard to the front yard, and a half inch difference higher or lower between the neighbor's property and our own to determine the existing conditions. Sometimes we can't even get to the design of our project because we can't even agree on the starting line. With reasonable and acceptable methods to approximate runoff from previously developed properties, there's hardly a reason or any benefit to precisely dissecting the existing conditions to the same level of detail as our proposed project. I tell you that so you'll understand that there are seemingly innocent sentences throughout this document which can become absolute showstoppers under the rigorous enforcement of an overzealous review engineer who is under pressure to do anything and everything to fix flooding. The enforcement of these regulations, the combination of duplicative conservative methodologies and the precision of 0.0 feet, which quite frankly isn't much better at 0.05 feet, has been the nightmare scenario that you've heard about for the last 18 months. Thank, Thank you. you for your service to the city. The next speaker is Barbara Messner, and after Ms. Messner is Claudia Cotton. Good evening. Good evening. Fascinating when somebody starts their petitions to run for office, they suddenly come up to speak at council when, you know, these issues have been going on for a long time. And as far as due process, you know, the city manager, you know, there was no advertisement in the paper for this meeting, none. And you say that it's not your, your duty to advertise, but you advertise for planning and other things. Um, like I said, there's, there's a conflict with the people who will be benefiting from this, including people who will be selling real estate in these new places. Um, and this affects, um, you know, you're talking about public works. You know, Miss um, Miss Wooten wants to have something for the uh, in February for the new uh, for one new person that was killed last year. I'd appreciate it if you'd have so, uh, something for a permanent memorial because I really appreciate the fact that you're taking action now, Mr. Rouse. And as far as the public workers, this is just one of the of the palm trees that we replace every time there's a storm in every two years. Do you have any idea what this costs to come from Florida? And our public works uh, people, um, our police fire and rescue. I, I listen to uh, your shiny new jewelry is really glaring. Um, you know, I listen to y'all talk about caring about the, the employees. You don't care about the employees. Um, and you talked about, you know, police being used for certain things and then they weren't available for something else. What about the polar plunge? What about everything else that you have where the police, fire, and rescue are pulled away from their areas? Y'all don't care about public safety. And I hope everyone will go back and listen to this workshop. And I'd like to know, besides the lobbyist, uh, if we paid Mr. Berlucci to go up there and lobby for us. You know, there's a hatch act. Uh, please stick to the item at hand. I am. I'm talking about due process and your duty to protect everyone. And you don't have the you-know-what's to say anything when Jafari Jones screams and threatens at you, okay, but you Ms. scream Ms. at me. Messner, yes. you're out of order. I know. You're supposed to speak on the particular item, period. Well, thank you. Audio. Okay, Mr. Um, Mr. Stiles has agreed that it's air, th air three minutes 
by the Constitution, which other people have mentioned before. Thank you. Okay. The next speaker is Claudia Cotton. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council, Mr. Tehaney and staff. My name is Claudia Cotton. I represent the Coastal Virginia Building Industry Association. Pleased to see you tonight. Um, as leaders of the development and engineering community in Virginia Beach, we really appreciated the opportunity to sit with staff and engage with uh, our experiences with the new design manual over the last 18 months. And I'd like to thank them and applaud your staff. They've done a tremendous job listening to our concerns and working on solutions. We support all the recommendations both in A with the design manual and the other two that you've already passed. Um, we do feel like it's been a good start and good conversation, but we truly do not think the work is done. Uh, we have more to do, and we understand that the Process Improvement Committee has been tasked with monitoring the process changes to see if these amendments will show some results. So we would like to see our group reconvene in about six months and assess where we are. We intend to stay engaged. We feel strongly about the enormous implications that these regulations have on future development, redevelopment, and affordable housing in the city. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Before she depart, yes. Come, I would just like to you know, Councilmember Jones and I met every Friday, I think August through September and October, and what a great, it was a great, robust, honest interchange between the staff and industry, and I think even the, the council members as well. And, I, and we did commit to continue this liaison group and to come back in six months and to continue to look. And I do appreciate, you know, we could have, where we found our common ground, and I guess later tonight we'll talk about our non-common ground, but that's okay. It was all good, and I do appreciate the support of the industry, and I see Tuck's back there in the back as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Councilman Moss. Thank you, Claudia. Thanks, everyone. We have one additional speaker, Mark Ricketts. Oh, yeah, he was in the meetings. Good evening. Good evening. How are you tonight? Hey, doing okay. Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, uh, my name is Mark Ricketts. I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Virginia Beach. Uh, I also happen to be a licensed professional engineer, licensed land surveyor. I work in the uh, private sector. I've actually been a member of the Virginia Beach staff for 13 years. So I've managed to see the the regulations and the issues from both sides. In we're fact, hiring, I was part of a... Way. Pardon, Matt? Didn't mean to cut you off, so we're hiring, by the way. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, in fact, I was part of a fantastic group of people who actually started the Development Services Center when it started as a separate department uh, and then eventually became part of the planning department. So I've been proud to be a, a resident of the city of, city of Virginia Beach and then also to participate as an engineer and land surveyor in the process uh, in watching the city grow in, in uh, my lifetime here. Um, I, too, like Ms. Cotton, Tuck Bowie, Councilman Moss, Councilman Jones, uh, the city manager uh, was at a few of our meetings, served on this particular committee. So I, I'd like to bring to the table the fact that I do support as, a, as an engineer, part of the development community, part of the engineering community, the fact that we continue these, uh, this committee uh, so that we can review these issues. Um, I think the staff has done a fantastic job of pulling this information together. We did find common ground, as you talked about. There are still some things that need to be worked on, as with anything. Uh, particularly in engineering, you can find that there are those things that you can look at the same information and have a slightly different opinion, but I think it's, it's incumbent upon all of us to continue to work together to make these things work and to work well together. So I just wanted to take a moment, state that, and uh, state that I support the, the committee and I hope that uh, we'll continue to move forward with this. So I appreciate it. Thank hey, you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. You. That's all the speakers. Okay, do we have a motion? Move it to adoption. Okay. Second. Second. Any discussion? I could just say one more thing. Is throughout all this process, we did not change the standard. I want the people that went out there and voted for the bond referendum to know that the standard that we adopted in our regulations was not lowered. That's an okay. important thing to Thank get across. You. Thank you. Hey, moving on to ordinance to establish a capital project. Mayor, vote. Yes. sorry, Mayor. Just close the vote, Terry, please. By a vote of 10 to 0, you've approved the resolution. Oh, thank you. The resolution, thank you. I'm losing my voice okay. quickly, so I'm trying to expedite. My apologies. 
Okay, item number six, ordinance to establish uh, capital projects 1-030 and 1-031 and appropriate 54938822 in fiscal year 2021 schools reversion and revenue sharing formula funds. Mr. Mayor, before we start the speakers, I need to ask the city attorney a legal question. Of, yes. Do I need to make my statement now or be at the time of the motion? I would go ahead and make it now because the discussion will occur right after the okay. speakers. Okay. Thank you very much. Dear fellow Virginia Beach residents, to my fellow residents and collective employer, this is the preface to a more detailed disclosure to follow that has been reviewed by the city attorney to ensure that it comports with the disclosures I have to make on the school board's reversion funding request resolution on the city council's agenda item next on the table for consideration. As late as last Wednesday afternoon, I received a call from Deputy City Attorney Mr. Ingram informing me that he was composing a disclosure letter for my execution to inform the public that my spouse is a teacher in the employee of the school board, and that being the case, I judged myself able to objectively assess the issue at hand, cast a vote, and act in the public interest, as I have done many times. It was Mr. Ingram's call that first alerted me to the fact that this ordinance would be considered tonight. Therefore, I engaged in composing an analysis to educate the public and my colleagues on the merits of the school board's request. Yesterday afternoon at 4.40 p.m., while I was driving in my car, I was informed in a telephone call with the city attorney, Mr. Stiles and Mr. Ingram, that the legal understanding that was the foundation of Mr. Ingram's call last Wednesday and under which I had been working was based on a prior attorney general opinion that was likely supplanted by a more recent opinion of the Commonwealth attorney. As a result of that call, I immediately requested through the city attorney's office a written opinion from the Commonwealth attorney who was kind enough to provide the opinion on an expedited basis, which I will read shortly. The Commonwealth attorney's opinion is that because the ordinance presently before the council relates exclusively to the school board, I must refrain from participation in the discussion or the vote on this item because of my wife's employment by the school board. If this item dealt with broader budget, including other offices, departments, and priorities, which has been the case in the past, I would be able to participate and vote. The prior opinion of the Attorney General did not specifically address this distinction. Needless to say, this news received just yesterday afternoon, Monday, January 31st, 2022 at 4.40 p.m. on such extremely short notice in advance of today's meeting and providing no opportunity to revisit the Commonwealth's attorney opinion with the Attorney General in a timely fashion was disappointing. I know just a little bit now how the feeling of a commander on the eve of the battle being called home to deal with a personal illness whose treatment could not be delayed. I regret that my work on the people's behalf will not be entered into the record and the deliberations this evening. I will, however, be able to post the disposition of this, of this effort tonight to make my analysis available to the public, though I will be precluded now and in the future from engaging my council peers or city staff on this issue unless this issue ever comes before as an element of a larger issue such that it is not a singular school board issue for consideration. Post tonight's meeting, the draft such that it was developed as of 4.40 p.m. yesterday will be posted on social media and read publicly on public media for the public's education. The city attorney has orally advised me that the former action is not legally precluded. If my understanding of the city attorney's legal counsel is incorrect, I request that he revise me to that effect at the conclusion of my statement. Now I will read the actual opinion from the Commonwealth attorney and I appreciate everyone's indulgence. Dear Councilman Moss, in an email from Deputy City Attorney Rod Mr. Ingram dated January 31st, 2022, an opinion was requested under the Conflict of Interest Law of Virginia regarding your participation in Virginia Beach City Council's discussion and voting an ordinance to establish the capital projects 1030 and 10-21 and to appropriate 50, $4,938,822 in the FY Schools Reversion and Revenue Sharing fund Formula Funds, here and after called Capital Projects Ordinance. 
specifically given your spouse's employment by the Virginia Beach City Public Schools, you ask whether the Virginia Conflict of Interest Act prohibits you from participating in this discussion and voting on this matter. Acqu according to your email, your spouse is employed by the Virginia Beach City Public Schools and earns more than 5,000 annually from this employment. Virginia Code Section 2.2-3112 prohibits any participation by a government officer in a transaction where the officer has a personal interest, a personal interest being defined under ALIA as annual income that exceeds or may reasonably be anticipated to exceed 5000 from salary, other compensation, friends, benefits that accrue to an officer, an employee, or to a member of his immediate family. Immediate family is defined to include in ALIA a spouse, personal interest in the transaction, etc. I'm trying to cut some of this out, but I'll put it into the record, Mr. Mayor. I realize time is important. And this is the part that gets down to, well, I'm going to get this as many pages, but I'm trying to get to the essence because I talked a little bit about there. I'm aware of the opinion of the Attorney General dated September 18, 2020, in addressing the application of subsection 2.2-3112B1. Whether a school board member would be permitted to participate in a transaction which would apply to a large group of people, including the school board member's spouse. The attorney, this is the school board to school board, mind you. The attorney general concluded under the application, since there were more than three people in the group that included the school board member's spouse, the school board member could participate so long as there was also a compliance with the requirements for disclosure, which I previously have done. The opinion did not address the application of section 2.2-3112AI. As set forth, it states, employees having a personal interest in a transaction must disqualify themselves if the transaction has an application solely to a governmental interest in which they have a personal interest. This is a distinction between the previously described prohibition. It is based upon that section that the city commonwealth attorney has concluded that I cannot vote this evening or participate in the discussions. I am going to request a review and revisit this by the attorney general, Jason Meares. Uh, well, I respect and thank you that I have to abide by the opinion as given, but I do take great exception that it, that was the intent or the meaning, but I will be withdrawing until this matter is concluded, and I appreciate your indulgence. Both the letter and my statement will become part of the record, and I appreciate your time, and I appreciate the public's consideration. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Moss. Okay. Um, no, we, uh, do we, we have, have a motion and We have speakers. Yeah. Uh, okay, the speakers. Speak, Mrs. Marsh. And after Ms. Marsh is uh, Melissa Lutzen. Good Lutzen. evening. Good evening, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson. On your ordinance here to appropriate $54,938,000 in reversion funds to the school district. I am opposed to this because, as been said earlier tonight, I think we're going to run out of money before we pay all the bills. And this has been happening every year since I've been speaking to you about the pension crisis that is a global pension crisis. And currently, from numbers that I can get through Truth in Accounting, even though I have asked for them from our own VBGov, um, I feel that we are $1,533,000,000 in arrears on funding the pensions. So if I were working for this city, I would be very concerned, is it going to become like Detroit, Mr. Dehaney? They never thought in 2013 that they would declare bankruptcy. But they did. And when they did, people who worked there, someone I know who worked in Detroit for 40 years, no longer has that pension. And we're many years out from that, eight years. So it's really important we look at this, especially when we note that it used to be a zero balance. It was a surplus until 2003. The hands by council only started going into the cookie jar in 2003. So in 20 years, we've gone up to $1.5 billion. If my numbers are off, give me more correct numbers. But that's a big number. And I stood here before you, Ms. Wilson, I remember you speaking up on this. And we had these charts that were going to pay down the amortization of this loan. It was going to pay it off in 25 years. Well, here we are a few years into it. And I bet if these charts were updated, which I keep asking for, 
the numbers would be off the charts. So I'm asking you to defer this until we have a more complete look at all the bills. We don't know what all the bills are. And I've sent you all the truth and accounting comprehensive look at the city. I don't do this. They do it for 75 cities. And they tell us that we are in arrears, the 1.533 billion. So I'm really asking you to slow down this process, take a look at it, and know that the taxpayers are nervous about you having to raise taxes and reduce services. And if I were going to work here, I don't know if I would do it because I don't know if this pension or the benefits for retirees are going to be very good a few years down the road. So you might want to really take a look at funding this and not just giving more money back to the schools. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Melissa Lucasen. Well, she's coming up. Mr. Dehaney, uh, a few years back, Patty Phillips did a analysis of everything and got it out to us. And I think it's been a while. Mm -hmm. You think we could get Kevin to do something for us? I look into it with the finance director. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Um, sorry, I take this off. Um, I actually, this is, I was running late from traffic. Mr. Berlucci, I hope you had support. I had a great speech writ, writ, written for that. Um, but this is, I, this was the one that I was going to pull myself from because I thought we really had good support here. Um, Thank you. Um, so, school board, as far as I am in support of you guys passing this for school board. Um, Ms. March actually makes some good points on retirement funds. Um, I, I'm just speaking as the citizen. I am in a, a group, a, you know, a local forum, and I wish I knew how great teachers were then as I do now. I am in this group with a lot of Virginia Beach teachers, and I see a lot of frustration, and I see a lot of um, feeling like the city doesn't care about them. Okay, right now we're obviously in a in a very big situation um, with there's some political stuff going on, and they're feeling that, and these are the people that show up every day to teach our children. I read through Miss Pate's um, uh, the CFO for VBCPS. I read through the letter, you know, she countering why. I have some safety concerns. Listen, my kids went to Cox and First Colonial. Um, <laughs> you know, conditions of our schools, they're just not, they're not great, okay? And I think every one of us know this. A huge concern is safety. There's some safety issues that need to be taken care of. Um, there, and not just, you know, with locks and doors, but flooring and things like this that need to get done. And there was a really valid point of them saying that there's a plan for maintenance of these schools, painting and doing all these things. If we do not get them these funds back, they're not going to be able to do these things, which then sets the course for getting behind on everything else. And I, you know, I, I understand the concern. I, I did read that some of the, the, I guess, the excess that the school board didn't expect to have was because of what revenue from the city, which is amazing. Like, that shows we're in great economic position. As a small business owner, I can tell you that our business is flourishing in the city, okay? This is a really great time in the city. It's not a great time for our schools. It's not a great time for our teachers. And I I think they need your support on this. And I would just ask you guys to, to take care of it and approve this and send that money back to the schools so we can get some things done. Okay? Thank you. Thanks a bunch. Mm -hmm. The last speaker is Barbara Messner. Ms. Messner. Good evening. I appreciate um, Ms. Marsh coming back to speak. Um, and, you know, the school reversion funds, um, this has been brought up many times, but uh, nothing is ever done. And the school teachers, every time you raise the budget, as far back as 2012, the teachers come here, oh, oh, please help us. It's the students. It's the students. It's all, all employees that need help. And as far as the conflicts, I noticed um, Mr. Moss left. Um, 
Colin Stolle has admitted conflicts. And um, so does Mr. Mr. Moss on, um, you know, Linetti. He's flip-flopped, I don't know how many times, since 2014. And uh, it's a toxic work environment all over the city. And, you know, I watched, uh, you call her Deb. You know, she works 24-7 as a paid lobbyist, 24-7. And she reports virtually. I can't even imagine what she's paid. And you're looking for money to help the employees? Please look at the salaries and the benefits. Um, yeah, uh, Mr. Moss's conflicts with Owls Creek, the arena, um, on and on. Since I miss being able to speak because I was trying to watch y'all, um, VB Strong for Santerra. You know, you're not, the toxic environment was shown even by Hillard Hines, who you paid what? 600000 to not find anything wrong. Um, but these people are still fighting, and, and they deserve a permanent memorial. You've taken money and misused it that's supposed to go to these people. Uh, Christopher Rapp, Catherine Nixon, Alexander Gusev, Missy Langer, Mary Louise Gale, Robert Bobby Williams, Tara Welch Gallagher, Richard Nettleton, Joshua Hardy, Lakita Brown, Ryan Keith Cox, and Herbert Burt Snelling. And I, I am, do you want to sign yeah. up for uh, open mic? Yeah. Thank um, you. Ms. Messner, we're going to make a correction of something you said. We have a committee right now looking to put together a group of people, including the victims, to plan to, for input. No money has been taken away from this initiative. I'm talking about VB Strong, CARES Act, everything else. VB Wrong as a... Uh, okay. Okay, but I'm Good well point. aware. Yeah. I'm in touch with these people. I'm totally aware of what you do and what you pretend to be doing. I'm totally aware. Thank you. That's all the speakers, sir. Okay. So, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to move for approval and then after a second, just make Sorry. a couple of comments. Okay. Any other comment? Yeah. I just want to say that um, I agree that the schools, the staff, the children, this has been a really incredibly rough time for them. And this is a historical amount of money that we've never had before. And we asked for the schools to go back and to sort of rearrange how it was being spent to put it to use where we could get more built, and, and they, they did that. Um, Eight million is going to Prince Sand High School, seven and a half million is going to Betty F. Williams, five million is going to Bayside High School, and the, the um, artificial turf that we've been hearing about, well, Mr. Rouse could probably speak to it much <laughs> better than I can, but it saves money because of maintenance. Uh -huh. But also, what hasn't been brought out is it also helps with injuries, uh -huh. where you get less sprains and things like that. So it'll, it'll help protect our athletes as well. So, you know, when you look at it, it's being spread across two schools, uh -huh. too. So uh -huh. I, I think the school board have worked really hard. They know their priorities. They are a duly elected body. And it's very fortunate that that money is there for them to put to good use. Absolutely. Yeah, Mr. Rouse. Thank you. Um, I think we all understand how, how incredibly um, the, pr the amount of pressure our, our school um, boards, our teachers, our students, um, our educators, uh, the type of pressure that they're under these, these days. So I think it's extremely important that um, this council, you know, we, we find a way to, to, to continue to support them uh, going forward and supporting our, our schools and supporting our students. Um, here with me tonight, I, I have my intern, um, Ari here from First Canonial, um, which is my alma mater. I know Councilman Branches and Berlucci as well went to First Colonial from Legal Studies Academy. Bayside. 
and and Bayside. <laughs> um, but this is our future here. And so when we talk about investing in reversion funds back to our schools, I see that young man and many other young men and women, um, him, her, they, all make sure I get all the acronyms there. Um, they are our future. And so uh, I'm, I'm proud to support this initiative um, as well. And again, like you said, this even though this is historic, we also are living in historic times. We've been through a pandemic as well, um, asynchronous learning at home. We're asking our teachers to do so much um, and we haven't even touched the, the mental health part of um, things that our kids are going through, just dealing with the pandemic. And so um, hopefully uh, with the reversion of these funds will help in that initiative to, to build in um, better and brighter young men and women. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, vote is open. By a vote of nine to zero, showing Mr. Moss absent. However, we will put his conflict letters in the um, minutes. Uh, you have approved the ordinance. Thank you, Madam Clerk. All right, moving on to a planning item. Uh, number one, a resolution to adopt and amend the Virginia Beach Comprehensive Plan 2016 Array Stormwater Impacts for Discretionary Land Use Applications, deferred from January 4. The first speaker is Barbara Messner. After Ms. Messner will be Tuck Bowie. Oh, did they get Mr. Moss? Yeah, I think. Perfect, I think. What do we do? Oh, I saw Rocky come on. Let's go. Let's go. I'll have my say later. Welcome back. Good evening. Okay, um, which one, Amanda? K-1. K-1 planning, resolution to adopt and amend a uh, comp plan 2016, stormwater impacts for discretionary land use application, deferred planning commission denial. And I need to say, you know, the fact that y'all have interns, I think is totally inappropriate. Uh, that you have help, you don't have time to respond to us, um, none of you. You only respond to those who help uh, keep you in office. Okay, so um, stormwater. I've already gone over the stormwater, and you spent 260000 to advertise and spin, and you're spending... 260000 on the Holloway case. And you, you did change it instead of formally to actually who our reps are because there, it's, there's an appeal. There's, okay. You know, air workers can't keep up. You're using them for the wrong things. And this is the debt bond. This is the first phase. First phase. Um, <coughs> Five hundred and sixty-seven million, and some of it's a ninety-five-year plan, and the desired cycle is fifty years. Um, and you were talking about Mr. Tower. You're so worried about parking in the oceanfront. Oh my gosh, you're you're so caring, except for your constituents who you never respond to. Um, anyway, um, I'm, I'm in opposition. You keep amending everything. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Tuck Bowie. Uh, Mr. Ralph. Mayor, point of clarification. Um, okay. Ms. Ms. Messner, mm -hmm. uh, how are you doing this evening? Okay. Um, my high school uh, intern is, is a part of their educational requirement that they get um, internships throughout the city. Trust me, I wish I can afford an, an intern, uh, but I think our no, internship. I didn't say uh, well, well, okay, okay, I, I'm, ahead. Not, I'm not okay. paying them. Okay. Uh, but what I'm what mm -hmm. I'm saying is, um, really, I, I'm proud to have this this young man and give him a first look at how our city government, local government, um, operates. 
And so, and I'm, I'm proud to have popped my alma mater. And so we can have this um, young man here get a get a insight into local government and fulfill his civic responsibilities. And hopefully one day soon, he could be sitting up here on this council as well. Thank you. Okay, I didn't, okay. Well, I didn't mean you, to Smith. infer. Thank wait, you, no, Smith. I have a right to respond. Is He's you, speaking to me. The next speaker is Tuck Bowie. And after Mr. Bowie is Claudia Cotton. There's a reason things are supposed to be Ms. Mesner, you're Ms. out of order. Mr. Bobby Dyer. Sit down. Hey, good evening, Mr. Bowie. Good evening, Mayor Dyer, Vice Mayor Wilson, members of City Council. My name is Tuck Bowie. I am a local builder and developer whose office is located in the city of Virginia Beach. I'm also a member, and I'm very fortunate to have been a member, of the stakeholders group who worked rigorously on looking at your stormwater regulations, who spent a lot of time um, meeting and, and working on these issues. And I'd be remiss if I didn't thank Councilman Moss and Jones, City Manager Duhaney, members of your planning staff, your DSC, your Public Works Department, and your um, Stormwater uh, Department for allowing the development community to have an opportunity to come to the table and sit down and have these discussions. Uh, I applaud Council for approving the changes to the uh, regulations, and my hope is I'm also a member of the, of the um, Process Improvement Steering <coughs> Committee, and my hope is that Council is going to allow that committee the opportunity to monitor these new regulations and report back to you to let you know whether or not they have made a difference. I've talked to your planning director, Bobby Dehine. He's indicated that he has the metrics that we can measure those against, and it's my hopes that we'll be able to do that. Now I'm going to ask you tonight to defer any action on this amendment to the comprehensive plan. And Councilman Moss and I have talked about this. My question to Council is, what's your hurry? You've already got in place the, the process and the procedures that allow your staff to look at any discretionary rezoning that comes before Planning Commission and City Council to get a rigorous review. We've talked at during these uh, stakeholder meetings about a way that that process can be less onerous if you're willing to do a proffer but more importantly than that, this comes before you tonight with a, rec a unanimous recommendation of denial from your planning commission. This council appoints that commission. The commission is responsible for reviewing and updating the comprehensive plan. Why not give them the opportunity as part of that process to take a look at this? And if there is concern about the optics of what the citizens voted on with your bond referendum, which I doubt, but if, if those optics are a concern, then council can direct the planning commission to look at that first before they do the rest of that. Again, I thank you for your time. I thank you for your service. And Mr. Moss, I thank you for allowing the development community to have a seat at the table. Thank, thank you, you very much. The next speaker is Claudia Cotton. After Ms. Cotton is Mark Ricketts. Welcome back. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, members of council, I would just echo what Mr. Bowie um, said. And I just want to be clear um, this amendment and all the other things that we have done so far, it does not water down the standards. Nothing's going to be built that doesn't comply with the standards. And I would just uh, encourage you to defer, as Mr. Bowie did. I believe it's a dangerous precedent to run through a comp plan amendment this quickly when you have a process in place. Um, I think you're preparing soon to update your comp plan, and I think it would be reasonable to include discussion on this in that process. Thank you. Thank you. The last speaker is Mark Ricketts. Welcome back. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. And I come back before you as a Bayside High School graduate, actually, as a matter of fact. So thank you very much for, uh, for having me. Uh, again, I, I kind of want to uh, echo the same thing. And again, I kind of set the stage for it a little bit when I was up here a, minute, uh, a few minutes ago about the fact that I was a member of the city staff for 13 years. As part of the planning department and watching that particular process play out, I found that the, the planning commission being an integral part of the comprehensive plan, any comprehensive plan amendments and those sorts of things, I think is very important to the process. They bring value to the process 
through the staff, they bring value to the process. And I would certainly recommend that this be included as part of the updating of the comprehensive plan. Again, that's on a five-year cycle. I believe that cycle is this year. If I'm off a year, I apologize, but I believe it is this year. So I think by, um, by using the opportunity to include the planning <laughs> commission in it, remanding it back to the planning commission and letting them this uh, change work its way through the process, I think would be uh, better for everybody. It would better be better for the process and the result that, that uh, we would get from it. So again, I would I would uh, suggest and recommend that it be deferred and remanded back. Oh, to the thank you. And being from Irvington, New Jersey, yes, high school, uh, not mom left out of the loop tonight. What well, can I do? well, welcome. We're glad that you're here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's all the speakers, sir. All righty. Do we have a motion, Ms. Wilson? Um, I've been sitting on this body for a for a long time, and I don't think we've, in, in my memory, and maybe I'm wrong, that we've ever passed something that. The planning with, with the comprehensive plan that the planning commission had unanimously voted to deny and, and that really bothers me um, so I'm kind of thinking that I think it might be a good idea if we could send it back to planning and let them work with the stakeholders and the community and so that they can come back with something that that they feel comfortable with because they are our advisors in all of this we have we appointed them and we asked them to give us advice in what we do with planning. So I'd like to make a motion that we send this back to the planning to let them work with the stakeholders and come back with a recommendation. Second. I don't see any discussion. I have a discussion and a substitute motion that we it be approved. I appreciate that the Planning Commission did advise us. I'd more greatly appreciate that 72% of the public based on a commitment that this council made, that this council unanimous, save Mr. Branch, voted for to direct to make this change to a planning document guidance. It's not regulatory. So here we went out and asked the public, who we work for, and they gave us some advice. They said, we took your resolution for granted, which we've implemented all those pieces, save this piece, we trusted you that you would keep your commitment. You made a commitment. You voted for a commitment. And now that 72% of the public's voice, which is more than anyone on here got votes for, is not as important as 11 Planning Commission members. Because they say, well, whose city is it? The public city or the Planning Commission city? Are we worth our word or not? I'm not willing to go out, and some of you aren't up for life, and tell people that I told you and I voted for this, and we would do it by this date, which we've already deferred several times. This is not a big statement when you look at what it says. It's a planning document. And that's what the planning, that's what the comp plan is. But if you are happy with telling 72% of the people they got it wrong, and tell them, oh, you probably didn't really rely upon that resolution anyway. I don't know if they did or didn't, but I know I made the commitment to do it, and I didn't make that contingent upon making 11 members of the Planning Commission happy or being feel, felt left out. And I, and I went out, as many as you did as well, on the road touting that resolution and what it told the people and why they should be comfortable with the fact that they could trust us to vote to borrow that money because our always concern is what? That we're not going to follow through. We're not going to maintain the zoning. We're not going to do these things, and they're going to spend a lot of money, and they're not going to get the benefit delivered. I have a difficulty not keeping my word. Now, if someone wants to come up here and have a new resolution, amend that resolution, say we really didn't mean what we said, we want to change our mind, we want to change our commitment of what we told the people, great. I'm not voting for that. But I'm making a substitution that it be approved, because that's the commitment this body made to the public on September 7th, 2021, and on election day, 72.4% of the public voted yes. So why are we not listening to the voice of the people who put us here? Okay, we have a substitute motion. Do we have a second? Second. And, and I want to comment on why because I did carry that re resolution around with me 
and sh talk to the people about it. And this was one of the this was one of the important elements of it. And I know that we deferred that resolution at least once. I'm, I'm pretty sure we did because we wanted to get the the wording right. And I know that there was some angst uh, this, uh, that had been expressed by the development community about the wording, but we approved it anyway. And I, I think what we said was that, I think you're taking this literally, that it means we're not gonna have any more development and that's not what we mean. I think we have the, the opportunity to, to show what we really mean. Um, maybe it's unfortunate that we applied it to the comprehensive plan, but we did it. And then we did carry that, I carried that resolution around with me when I spoke to groups and I read every part of it and this was one of them. And I, I, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant. I, I think the message we might be sending to our public is that we didn't know what we were doing maybe and we might use loopholes throughout the run, referendum uh, process and I've got to stick with my my first vote. Okay, anybody else? If I can uh, say this, you know, I appreciate the comments and you know feelings of my uh, two colleagues that uh, left over there. The duty and responsibility of government is to make sure we get it right as we can. Ever since I've been on council since 2004, we've always been trying to find that delicate balance between the del uh, development community and, um, and other things. We have had pr process problems in the city for years. We have had problems with permits and in inspection for years. We just recently had, and you know, even Mr. Moss admitted, uh, some great dialogue about coming together where we had a blend of government with the development community with discussions that uh, were fruitful. Before items get to us, they go to planning commission. It to me is just more prudent and practical that they are involved in the decision loop and get the same buy-in and understanding of what we're trying to do. So as we go through, and you know, Tuck mentioned the process improvement. Mm -hmm. By delaying, it, we're not saying we're going to throw this out. We're saying we're going to delay it to get it right so we can have that win-win for both sides. So with that, uh, you know, I, you know I, uh, I'm going to be voting against the uh, substitute and for the original. Okay. Votes open. We're voting on the substitute. Uh, by a vote of five to five. Motion fails. Okay. Well, the other motion might fail too. <laughs> All right. So now you need to vote on the. Now we'll motion. vote on the original motion. Give us one second. We're opening the vote. Okay. Votes <laughs> open. <laughs> Where are we going to defer? No, to right. defer. Right. This is a motion to defer. <laughs> no, no this is a motion to oh, yeah, refer it back to the planning commission. Planning commission. All right. By a vote of six to four, this item has been referred back to the planning commission. Oh. Okay, thank you. Um, now, at this point, uh, we have appointments. Bad vote. <coughs> to the Arts and Humanities Commission, Alicia Phillips. Bayfront Advisor Commission, Whitney Graham. Bikeways and Trails Advisor Committee, D. Oliver. Excuse me, a point, I need a point of clarification. We we deferred that. That was a vote to defer it, correct? It, refer, refer it back to planning, planning commission. Refer, you know, refer back to, uh, to planning okay, commission. Okay, then I'd like to change my vote if I can. Oh, can we do vote? Because I thought, I thought it was deferred to, I thought it was to defer to January 4th. I mean, I thought it, we, we was going to defer it I think again. you have to do a reconsideration. We can vote for it on February 1st. 
I thought you were on the prevailing side. I thought we were going to. I thought it was deferred. I didn't know it was deferred to planning commission. I just thought it was deferred again. Well, my it again. my understanding is that a member on the prevailing mm -hmm. side can make a motion to reconsider. Because you're still here on the same night of the public hearing, you can have that vote now, and if the the motion to reconsider carries, then you vote again okay. on the original motion. So for future clarification and process, can we just be clear on what, because maybe it's just me, I just, I did I thought it was just deferred. I didn't know it was deferred back to planning. I just thought we were going to defer it. Well, Bobby said deferred. I said no, it's to be going to yeah, planning so commission. Yeah, so I'll make a vote for reconsideration. Well, I'll second gonna, that. It's just okay. gonna, Probably won't pass, but... Okay. Um, you know, at this point, you know, uh, to, you know, to respect Mr. Rouse, we won't, you know, make a go ahead and do, you know, you, you have a motion for reconsideration. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And we have a second. We need a second on that. You got a second. I second. Which, okay. Yeah. Thank you. The vote's so, open. So this is a vote to reconsider, reconsider the prior vote, which would reopen the issue, and then you'd have a new motion. Correct. It gives you a chance to change your vote. Okay. <laughs> motion to reconsider. Uh, and I apologize to council. I, is passed eight to two. Okay, so now, now we need uh, a new motion. Now we need a new motion. Yes. The motion is to send this item back to the planning commission. Second. One second. We need to open the vote. Okay. <laughs> We're running out of votes, but we'll, you're good. So this is a motion to re to send it back to re to send it back to planning commission. Carrie, we close it. By a vote of five to five, that motion has failed. Okay. So we have nothing. That's right. It's okay. Well, I think we'll, we'll get Lewis. back to the drawing board. We'll be on the agenda for Lewis to be the deciding person. <laughs> yeah, let's put the pressure on him. Okay. <laughs> well, you don't have, you haven't done anything with the item yet, so. No, it's, we have nothing. Okay. Get back to appointments. Okay. Um, yeah. If there's no motion to approve and no motion to defer, then I think it fails. I think that's the result. It failed. There's nothing. Yeah. Now, um, could we bring this? Uh, no, no, Mark. Can we bring this back in another format uh, next voting meeting? Well, I, I would think that would be a motion to defer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. Well, then, February 14th. The, that would be February 15th, right? I think it's the 14th. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, can I make that motion to defer? Yes. Do we have a second? Good date. Second. Can we have discussion? Discussion. Um, my question, I just have, a, I guess, a parliamentary type question. If we didn't do anything, if it, if it failed, then but couldn't someone just bring it back on the agenda at another time? Well, it's a planning item, so I believe it would have to be re-advertised. Well, how long does it have to sit, Bobby? Anyway. It's not a land, it's not a land use application per se, so I think council could bring you it back. back. You just have to go back through the whole process. Correct. The whole process? You mean back to planning? <laughs> that's what I'm looking at. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's why we're in a big circle here. Um, so maybe that's what we want. Maybe so we, so we have a, a motion to defer. Is there a second? I'll second. second. Okay. Do we have a date certain on that? Um, the next formal session. Does nothing. It goes back to planning. Yeah. Fifteen. Yeah. I thought it was the yeah, it's, it's, Today's the first. So plus seven is eight. Oh, okay. Fifteen. So the, okay. Do we agree on the fifteenth? So yes. <laughs> so that'll take it back to the planning commission. No. To no. Look no, at. no. no. If you this can't. would this would allow it, it, your, your motion would simply have you doing the same thing right. over again gotcha. in two weeks. So Rocky, yeah. if we with do nothing, it goes back to planning. Okay. Huh? That's what he said. Well, somebody would have to. You said you would start the process again. Well, but somebody would have to do something to initiate that process. Okay. Usually, to get an item referred to the planning commission, you have an item that refers something to the planning commission. It then goes to them. They have their hearings, uh, and then they make their recommendation, and then it comes back to you. So that wouldn't happen automatically. 
uh, it would just it would just not have passed tonight. So it would this particular uh, item would just be ended, and somebody would have to then bring it forward with a referral ordinance to start it again. Could it be included when we do the comprehensive plan this year? It could be included. It, it, uh, certainly, it could be included in the discussion of the comprehensive, the, the broader discussion of the comprehensive plan. Yeah, so basically, if um, it really comes down to this, we have a motion on the table to uh, defer. But if we stick with the, you know, the original vote where uh, both ones were uh, both a positive and negative vote were a tie, we would refer back and start the process again. In the, yeah, in the, the clock it's again. Dead. It's, just, it's just over unless someone brings it up again. Right. Right. Oh. <coughs> okay. It's just confidence, but we will bring it back. We will bring yeah, it we, back. we would bring it back. I think that would okay. be the thing. And certainly give us, uh, I, th I feel, the time that we need. To, you know, mm -hmm. right. we'll see what happens. Okay. So the motion is to defer till February 15th. Uh, we, do, do we have a second on that? Yeah. I did. Okay. Third of February 15th. This is for it to come back to this body on yeah. February 15th. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You made it off your vote. By a vote of eight to two, you have deferred this item <laughs> to come back until February 15th. <laughs> okay. Took a while to get there. But tell you what, we're going to, yeah, but like I said, I think the important thing is that we get this right. You know, as we are looking to a future of running out of land and development, infill development, all the other things. You know, we got to make sure that, you know, we have a harmonious relationship. Uh, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have with affordable housing right now is the cost of building and the cost of land. So, but once again, you know, let's get the yes on this. I think that's got to be the uh, ultimate goal. Okay. So can I continue? No. Or do I have to start over on the appointments? Yeah, we're going to start over on appointments. I think you should start over just so that the record is right. clear if you don't. Start over. Please. Okay, Arts and Humanities Commission, Alicia Phillips. Bayfront Advisory Commission, Whitney Graham. <laughs> Bikeways and Trails Advisory Committee, D. Oliver. Um, the COG Review and Allocation Committee, Dean Dinsmore. Historical Review Board, Hayden Dubay. Housing Advisory Board, Phil Kizarnak. Kazmierak. Um, Military Economic Development Advisory Committee, Gregory Mazal. Um, Oceana Land Use Conformity Committee, John Rausch. Uh, Linwood Branch Liaison to the Open Space Advisory Committee. Bill Brown to the ITA Citizens Advisory Committee. Uh, Social Services Advisory Board, John Moxon. And I think that's it. Okay, thank you. Um, votes open. By vote of 10 to 0, you have appointed those names as read by Vice Mayor. Okay, any unfinished business? Any new business? Mr. Mayor? Yes. If I may, Mr. Mayor, members of council, uh, today, uh, Today, I'm sad to say that uh, uh, as, a, as a deputy sheriff and, a, and law enforcement officer for 30 years, it's a terrible day when we get the email saying we have to drape our badges for any reason. And today, we had a uh, disaster at Bridgewater, Bridgewater College where two public safety officials lost their lives. And then here at home, we lost uh, uh, a, a very good public servant, a true hero, in Master Police Officer Dave Nieves. He, he passed away today while surrounded by his family. He's a 26-year veteran of the Virginia Beach Police Department. Uh, I've served with him. I've worked with him on different committees. And he is, uh, there will certainly be a hole in, in the Virginia Beach Police Department without him here today. And uh, I see the officers in the back of the room nodding. And anybody that he's worked with or that he's uh, communicated with, he touched their lives and he made a difference. And if we had more Master Police Officer Dave Nieves, 
in the profession of law enforcement, I promise you it'd be a much, much better place. So we grieve with him and the family, and, uh, and may, they, may he rest in peace and take over it from now on. We will serve. You have served us well, and we will take it from here, Master Police Officer Dave Neobes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. You know, Rocky, thanks for, you know, uh, that awareness. But let me just say, you know, it, it takes a lot to be, become the safe city we, we are. And we are so grateful to our public safety folks that, you know, they give. And, you know, it's a high-stress job, too. You know, let's not kid ourselves. But, you know, Rocky, thank you very much. One more thing. Yeah. Um, I know February is Black History Month. And uh, Mr. Manager, if you'd please let us know, maybe in our Friday packet, the things that the city's going to do to help celebrate that. We'd really appreciate it. Okay, I will. Yeah, you know, good. That and now um, we have a group of, of, of really talented people. They're going to be putting on a play at the Zyder Theater sometime soon, and um, it, and it's a really highlight uh, and start launching a. a uh, Mr. Bellucci was at uh, the meeting with me, and to really launch an initiative of mental health awareness and you know, working on the problem. Okay, thank you, though. Okay, we are adjourn uh, re uh, adjourned and we're going into open mic.